Hello and welcome to another social media power talk hanging out on air. Today we're actually looking at franchises in the social media marketing age. Now franchises used to be big business. Through most of the 80s and 90s, that was last century, it felt like you could not attend a business meeting or go to a convention without someone somewhere trying to get you involved in a franchise business. Then as we got in, into the 21st century, things seemed to go quiet. Franchises, if they were still around, seemed to work in a quieter fashion. The push was less insistent, and in keeping with what happens when someone goes quiet, they commanded less and less of our attention. But does that perception reflect the real picture? Have franchises really declined in popularity? More to the point, has their impact on the business world waned? We all tend to be focused on social media networking these days, and marketing in the social web seems to be about us using all sorts of different tools. And franchises do not immediately spring to mind. Now, all these are superficial impressions created by the same mechanism that is always responsible for creating impressions in the first place. The buzz that surrounds any trend or movement that is designed to command attention. The purpose of the Hangout today is to go beneath the surface, tackle more than what is superficial, and actually understand just how all this works. With us today, trying to help us demystify the subject, is Nick Strong, CEO of ChooseYourFranchise.com. Hello, Nick. Hello, David. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. You're most welcome and thank you for your time and really we, we need to start with a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into franchises, how long you've been involved in and what got you into them in the first place. Okay, well I came into franchising about um, 18 years ago now. It, it shocks me to think that I've been in this market and in this world for so long. but. Uh, the thing that drew me into it, really, I came into it by the back door, and this often happens. In, um, in actual fact, my wife and I were working overseas. We were teaching English as a foreign language um, uh, back in the late 80s. And when we came back to the UK, we noticed that there was no modern language teaching for young children before they were at uh, secondary school age. So we decided that we would start a business to give uh, children be be before the age of 11 the chance to really get into language and enjoy language in, in a fun way uh, in schools and after schools. So, And we were, we were considering franchising that business, but we actually were bought by a competitor and, we, and I came into franchising through through that method and we and we learn I all learned all about franchising and how and how that could be used to help people get into business for themselves so so that was that was how I came into it those years ago that's awesome and and as it happens today Nick your day started out by you giving away money uh, yes yes <laughs> well this is, this is brilliant because essentially um, we have a screenshot of that first of all and Alex is just bringing it up now there it is and uh, it's brilliant because it really fits into part of the social um, media awareness and embedding in the social community and social goodness and we actually talked about that in our last hangout uh, on air last month so could you tell us a little bit more about what you did there yeah, we uh, we run uh, a number of businesses for our, for the franchise community, and one of them is called the Franchise Supplier Showcase. And at this event that we hold, we we sell the tickets to 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 our delegates, but we take the money from the from the seats that we sell, and we offer that money to a social enterprise, uh, which is a franchise called Food Banks. It's run by an organization called the Trussell Trust in the UK. And what they do is they focus on providing balanced nutrition diets, um, gift boxes to families that fall into temporary financial hardships. So they're run as a charity, uh, but and they require donations of food and financial donations. So uh, we are passionate about franchising in their work. So we, we, we wanted to contribute to that. So that's that's where that money went from, from last year's uh, showcase event. Whoa, right. I mean, it's fascinating you mentioned a charity being a franchise, really, because that seems to be paradoxical. So let's begin, really, by you help, helping us define um, what exactly is a franchise today. Yes, I think that 
the, the, the essence of a franchise is that um, a business or a charity uh, will take a proven system of operations and so it's normally an entrepreneur would have an idea and they would take that idea to market and over a period of time they would prove what doesn't work and they would prove what does work and what they find works they will document and they will create operation systems by which they run their business. Now, a lot of businesses find that, especially if they're geographically based, um, their scale of growth stops um, because of geographic and staff and, and travel uh, limitations on, on their operations. So they have to then consider how they're going to grow. Um, now, one route to growth is that they can find people that wish to to grow their own businesses by investing in the proven systems and the protected trademarks of a franchise business in order to replicate for their own uh, business development success. Okay. So in, a, in mean, essence, in essence really that's it. I was going to say this is brilliant and I'm going to, to sort of interpose a question here uh, before yeah. we go any further um, because essentially the way you describe it Two, two thoughts spring to mind. First of all, a franchise is potentially a shortcut to a ready-made model, uh, which has all the answers worked out from an entrepreneurial point of view. But isn't it also perhaps, if we flip that aside, you know, flip it on, on its head, an easy way for an entrepreneur to make money <laughs> from something he has reached a ceiling on? I think that a franchise is not for everyone. That's important to point out. Um, if you are an entrepreneur yourself, you absolutely should not uh, invest in a franchise because franchising isn't about creativity and ideas on behalf of the franchisee. The franchisor is the owner of the brand and the systems. The franchisee is the operator in local markets. The franchisee invests because they can then replicate that which is proven and and get to get up and running and get into profitable trading normally far more quicker than if they're trying to develop their own idea. Um, with a franchisor, obviously, um, growing through the investment of others and sharing their intellectual property and, their, uh, and allowing people to trade through their protected trademarks uh, and also providing them with ongoing training and support gives a win-win recipe that helps, that helps both sides progress into, into mm -hmm. successful trading. How, how does that work in practice? I mean, do, do you sign a contract? Do you agree to specific things? Are there checks and controls and balances? I mean, you know, it's fascinating to hear you describe that because, but because they're usually by definition franchises are geographically diverse and separated, what's to stop you saying, yeah, I'm going to buy the franchise, I'm going to set it up, and then you go on and do your own thing. How does anybody check on you? I think that's a very good question, and um, there's an element of maturity and responsibility on both sides. Certainly, a franchisor is responsible for the brand and what the brand means, and the franchisee is responsible for demonstrating that brand in trading practice in the local markets. Obviously, a brand will mean something and you have an expectation before you actually walk into the store uh, of, of what you might expect to receive when you actually walk in by way of service, look, feel, product that you might buy, service that you may receive. So it's a mutual responsibility between the two. Um, there are breakdowns in the, the delivery of services sometimes, and obviously that's where problems occur. The franchisor will have a contract by which the franchisee must abide, um, and the franchisor ultimately will have the last say as to who will and will not trade uh, in their brand and in their system. Have you? Have you? I mean, I know you deal with a lot of, uh, you see a lot of things in the franchise world and you, you have direct experience. Have you actually seen this kind of breakdown in, in communications and, and what happened? Well, it's, uh, it's very challenging when that happens and every franchisor will try and ensure that they select people that they believe understand their brand and are passionate about their brand and, w and wish to spend five years. Most franchise contracts are for five years, so, so you're entering into a five-year relationship and both parties have to agree that uh, working together is a good idea. Um, so um, unfortunately, 
um, whenever recruitment or selection is made into working partnerships, uh, no one ever gets it right all of the time on either side. So uh, when, when there is miscommunication and breakdown, most franchise will try, franchisors will try and help their struggling franchisees to find uh, a suitable replacement. So happy in, happy out is, is normally the, uh, the best way to do things. However, there are unfortunate times where breakdown of communications or poor service provision means that the franchisor has to step in um, and what you would call disenfranchise that, that person. And that, oh, wow. But that would be a last resort because, because that would be catastrophic. Um, uh, on the number of levels, you know, the brand reputation would suffer, as well as the as the local franchisee in terms of their own their own finances. So that would be a very last resort. That seems to be an incredibly challenging thing to do. I mean, you know, we've been discussing generally for the last two or three years, and especially Alex, who co-hosts this, um, this is a field in many ways, and we'll be discussing the importance of communication and how difficult it is to actually get right. And what you're describing here is that communication basically is key, not just in resolving the problem, but in the problem not happening in the first place through perhaps better selection or, or, or better fits between franchisor and franchisee. Um, mm. Within that, how difficult is it really to find the kind, the right kind of franchise You know, when you start looking through it? And, and how would you go about it? Do you, go online, do you go to a trade show, where do you begin? Well, in term, and you're talking about somebody considering investing in an existing franchise? Yes. Okay, well, I think that one of the benefits of franchising, um, which is on, on the flip side is a detriment, is there is much choice. So if, if you go onto the internet, obviously most people go onto Google first and, and they'll make general searches around be going into business for yourself, starting a franchise business, and that they'll find a number of different websites such as um, our own, which is called selectyourfranchise.com, and on there you can read expert articles, get information about how to sort out business plans as well as researching franchise opportunities uh, themselves. Um, but then obviously the benefit of finding a lot of opportunity means that you have the problem of filtering it down to just one because you can only invest in one thing. So normally it's a very difficult, challenging time for people considering their futures. Um, you know, um, I look back at my own experience of, of deciding to resign from my job, um, saying to my wife, will you back me in this? And it took her a long time to agree, with, <laughs> agree to do that. And all of the fear of going into giving up a regular salary and going into, into investment. So research online is very important. Going to trade can shows I, can I ask is here, useful. I was going to say, can I ask, is there such thing as an average cost for a franchise somebody should be aiming for? So you know, if you're going to take the leap, what should you be looking at ballpark figure? I think that you can invest in a franchise um, for the, anything from the amount of money you could borrow on a credit card um, up to uh, a million pounds or two million dollars. So, or, or wide range. Range. <laughs> it's, so I think it's very important for you to think: What am I passionate about? Passionate about what can I afford? Will my family back me? You know, there's some very practical questions that, that need to be answered first before you actually start going into the due diligence of, of, of selecting which franchise business is, is, is right for you. Hmm, okay, so, uh, that's really fascinating. Yeah, Alex, yeah, go ahead. I, um, okay, so I have a great question from Cheryl Deuce to build on this topic because she asks what are some questions to ask or red flags to look for to see if you can have a beneficial franchise relationship and I think that question can be both for the um, original you know the franchise that's considering you but it's also for the person that is considering to become a franchise owner okay well Cheryl that's a, that's a really great question and I think that the questions that you need to ask are around your future. That you know you are going to be considering investing a lot of money and a number of years of, of your life into following this system and working with this franchisor and their team. So I'd be saying to them, look, um, 
how do you support your franchisees? What training do you give? You know, be clear about what skills that you have and be very honest about the weaknesses that you have as well because you're going to need to draw on the strengths of the overall franchise team. One of the benefits of a franchise is if you go into business on your own, nobody is a skilled bookkeeper, an accountant, and a marketer, and a, and a salesperson, and an administrator, and as well as actually delivering the actual service. So what support are you going to receive from the franchisor in order to enable you to deliver and grow a successful business? Perfect. That's really good. And I think that's a, that's a great question, actually, because it's a kind of thing that, you know, most people begin to sort of think about this the moment they start considering a franchise. Okay, Nick. That's actually, <clears throat> those... can, I, can I just one more, one more time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> it's actually great that, uh, that Nick mentioned support, because if we go back to the live poll that we're doing, remember everybody out there, we're doing a live poll on uh, what would convince you to buy a franchise the most. It looks like Previously, it was 13%. It looks like it's gone up to 15%, say, the know-how and support you get. So it looks like you're changing some minds out there, Nick. Nick, you're right. convincing them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the beauty of the basic of, of, of having an interactive and live environment, essentially, because you can get answers to questions and get questions answered very quickly by somebody who knows the subject in depth. So essentially, you yes. begin to make better informed decisions as we go through. And anybody who hasn't tried our, our poll, please do so. Um, I think Alex will put the link on the stream, on the event stream, if she hasn't already. And you can just go there and check it out. OK, so mm. with that, <clears throat> Nick, let's talk about social media. Essentially, franchises, you know, I started out my description of this, that franchises seem to have dropped off most people's horizon because there's no, um, not as much strident noise about them so much. Uh, and that's because in a social media environment, they really don't feature as much as they used to in the past. You know, when in, in a pre-social media world, in every business convention, magazines, business papers, always had a franchise story or a new franchise being born. So how has social media impacted the franchise scene? Okay, well, that's that's a great question. And I think that social media has been uh, a bit of um, an unwelcome friend as far as the franchise community is concerned and the reason why it's been unwelcome there are some good reasons and there are some there are some bad reasons uh, what that the, I'll defend uh, my franchise or colleagues in in saying that a franchise is responsible for the integrity of the brand for the brand values for the brand voice for for, for what for for the client experience and perception of, of what they're going to receive now Every franchisor works very hard and diligently to build rhetoric that they can support, um, but they know that they can't keep everyone happy. Now, historically, what used to happen if someone was unhappy, then they might can complain face to face, they might complain to their friends, they might complain um, over the dinner table or whatever the case may be, but those words just got lost. They got lost in time and, and the reach and influence uh, was quite small. Most of us perhaps have a reach and influence of 5 to 15 people that we would see on a regular basis. So our scope of influence was, was, was quite limited. But now, obviously, uh, some of us have, um, have very significant influence. So if we have something to say about a franchise brand, if it's positive, it can be very good and good impacting. If it's negative, it, that can be very detrimental to the rhetoric that a franchise franchise always trying to build. So there's an interest in social media, but there's also um, a fear uh, of social media. But uh, and I think that the thing that everyone is starting to realise, and what I've been talking about for for years now, as passionately as I can, is that. Um, you have to be involved in the conversation. Every one of us now is a publisher. You know, I think most of us in business, most people who are 50 plus, 40, 50, maybe 60 years old who have got to MD, CEO level, they are used to controlling being the publishers and, so and, oper it's, and it's operate. It's, Nick, it's the old broadcast model, isn't it, really? Because exactly. That, that used to be what everybody was familiar with, 
and what a lot of people and a lot of businesses fall back onto the moment they're a little bit pressed. Yes. With now this that world, sorry. I was gonna say within that world, a couple of questions on that. You know, if you're a franchisee, how do you make sure that for instance you control the brand quality of what you broadcast or what you actually put out there? This all boils down to leadership from the franchisor themselves. Um, it's very difficult for a franchisee that may be enlightened in terms of the value of building conversation around their businesses and about the brand to want to be uh, an activist. But as you said earlier on, there are contractual constraints on, on what they can and can, can't say, what they can and can't do. And there are a number of franchisors that still might have an still might be issuing their franchisees with bromides of, of what they can actually publish, uh, which well, is obviously very <laughs> very limited and, and very controlled. Um, I, think they're, they're, they're <laughs> I think that they're very much, they're, 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 they're almost extinct now, thankfully, but, but there's, there's one or two kind of, there's one or two holding on onto that level of control, but it's a losing battle. And, and, and one that, that all franchisors must realize and that, that, that message is, is getting through. It's, it's a question of trust again, isn't it, in many ways, because you know, the, the franchisor has to trust that he's doing sufficient amount of work to basically communicate the, the brand values or the brand image with, with his franchisees and then perhaps empower them to project and amplify that. Is that I happening? Actually... Um, I, I, have a, I have a related comment that might help uh, progress this conversation from mm -hmm. Charles Perkins, and he says, with automatic contracts, Bitcoin, other advanced technology, what about cheap franchises that could support millions of contributors, creating a spectrum from community support and Kickstarter up to traditional franchising? So really what I think he's saying is, is is it possible that we have a spectrum of franchising in the social media age? Will those traditional franchises still exist? Can they continue to exist as we develop these other types of franchises? Ha, huh, that's a good question, Nick, because essentially it talks about the disruptive power of social media mm. when it impacts upon the, the traditional franchise model. So yes, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So how would you answer well, that? <laughs> First of all, I'd, I'd, I want to give a bit of a general answer and then, I, then, then, then I'll answer the, the question directly if I may. First of all, I'd say that there is no old model and there is no new model. And what I mean by that is um, the brand and its values is owned by everyone that uses that brand and everyone that wishes to talk about that brand. And one thing that every business owner needs to understand is that they are not the sole custodians of that brand and that brand message. It's, um, and this has been disruptive on every, on every element. Um, when it comes down to building franchise, when it comes down to selecting franchise, when it comes to operating franchise, it's actually all the same story. And this disrupts departmentalism. So the sales department and the marketing department and the admin department and the this and the that, they actually can't operate in isolation anymore, they have to operate as one unit because it's one story, and it's uh, and it's everyone that is active in the brand, from the franchisee to their clients, that really give the true value of what the brand is. Now, I think that in terms of sourcing crowd and building crowd, um, I think that that um, is a fantastic way of thinking about franchising. I don't know any franchises that look at crowdsourcing in order to build trading, um, but I think it's a fascinating idea and um, hey, uh, I've been very interested in exploring that further. <laughs> that is awesome and Nick, it's fascinating hearing you talk about describing the franchise internally like this because <clears throat> to many people, including myself in many ways, it's an, it's an opaque world, you know, we don't actually get to see very much about it. And hearing you describe the challenges and the way they can be overcome essentially reflects what is happening across the broader business world where, you know, departments never used to communicate very well are suddenly finding that unless they do, they are not as effective as they used to be. Uh, which is essentially a reminder that, you know, business of whatever nature it may be 
works and operates in the same environment these days. It's subject to the same pressures. And the solutions, most of the time, are very, very similar. On that note, we can go on to the next section, I suppose, which is a question. How can a franchise be made to work better today? And is there such a notion? I think that every business can always work better. And I think that every business leader is always striving to, to, make, to make their businesses better. Because if you're passionate about making money, uh, you have to be passionate about delivering services that, that people want want to buy and will value and will be brand, brand advocates to. So, so every business owner will be passionate about that. I think that where the disruption comes in is more around the operating paradigm of, of considering the brand to be central to the community, which is the part that is bro broken. So I think most businesses are run on more linear structures where, where there's very, you know, you've got the chairman, you've got the CEO, you've got the directors, you've got the managers, you've got the admin staff, you've got those on the sharp end, and you've got the clients. And I think that uh, these lines of, of are all being broken and I think that the social opens everyone up to being available to communicate with anyone in real time. Now that's very disruptive and a lot of people resent that. You know, if you spent the last 30 years building yourself up to your ivory tower uh, where, where you, you're used to giving the, uh, giving the orders, not, not actually being challenged uh, by, by the consumer that's not happy with the product that they just bought in, in wherever it is. That comes as quite a rude awakening. But I think this is our, our new world, and, we, and we, have to, we have to wake up to the fact that uh, we're all accountable. Mm, that's a perfectly understandable. And wow, <clears throat> what a challenge that is when, for a long, long time, uh, franchises were almost a walled garden working within you know, very specific parameters and, and basically the lines of command and control were very clearly defined. I want to say um, the Twitter crowd is actually, yay, we have a Twitter crowd today. Um, the Twitter crowd is actually really interested in this particular concept. We have both at Editrix Steph and at Tina Weiland really focusing on this notion of all of us being publishers, all of us being storytellers. And I think it's interesting um, to think about that in terms of a franchise when we traditionally think of them as very controlled, very regimented, versus this idea of anybody outside or within the company can express how they feel about it. So um, I just wanted to point that out, that the Twitter crowd seems very interested in this, uh, this particular concept. Mm, that's awesome. And on that on that very note, Nick, how would you address that? I mean, you know, how how far, you know, if we take a traditional with an inverted commas franchise which operates in a traditional environment, how much leeway does it have to actually adapt into the new requirements today without breaking the mold? I think that it has there is enormous potential. Every business that grows and creates loyalty, you know, brands don't just happen for nothing. They, 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 they happen because people are passionate about their clients, they, they've, re they've learned what their clients want, and they're passionate about delivering services and, and making those people into brand advocates that go and tell their friends and, and build that, that client basis. Every franchise will have grown through that ethos and mentality. So really, Franchise businesses and most business owners that are successful really need to see that this is not something additional. This is not an add-on. This is not a burden that you do that you have to fit in an hour every day as if you have to write an additional letter. This is really looking at the fabric of what you and your franchisees and your clients are passionate about your brand and especially from a directorship level this really transformation happens when the directors of the franchise really understand the power of gathering their, their, their brand advocates, their, their crowd into the conversation and giving context and structure to help people be passionate about about the services that they're receiving. So uh, at every level, from from staff at the head office to franchisees to their clients. So, but it has to come from directorship down, and they have to enable everyone involved to to to, to have a have a say. 
That's awesome. Okay, that's really cool. And let's get into the final stage now as we're getting to the halfway mark of our Hangout on Air. And basically the question is, and we started off with some of the things which you said about passion and requirements when you want to start a franchise. So from a practical point of view, if we're to start a franchise today, and you know, let's say I have done my homework in Wardley, I've talked to myself, I've talked to my wife, and we decided we wanted to do a couple of things, and we're narrowing down the short list, and then we're faced with the practicalities. So in terms of practicalities, what are the things which you would advise someone to keep in mind? In terms of actually the final stages of shall I invest in this franchise or not? Yes. yes. Well, I was, first of all, I think that you, you have to, you, you have, your passion has to, to grow the more that you find out. You have to believe in the people. And most of all, you have to see that passion in the franchisees, the people who are operating the system, and see what the, what, what the clients are saying. Because no matter what the rhetoric is, no matter what the advertising, advertisement says, no matter what um, you're told in the, uh, in the uh, meeting where you're both deciding whether you want to work with each other, the real story will come from, from the front line from people who are operating the franchise, from people that are buying the goods and services uh, of the franchisee. And it, this is another point of um, disruption that I think is important for both investors, franchisees and franchisors to understand. And that is in the old model, as, as you said, kind of push marketing, which, which falls, which still has a place. You know, awareness of a franchise and a franchise brand often starts in a place of advertising. But, and historically, you couldn't go anywhere else. You just had to think, do I understand it? Do I like the look of it? Can I see myself doing it? But you had no way of verifying whether, whether the claims were true. So, so you had to put faith, wasn't it, really? <laughs> a leap of faith right from the very start, and then the <laughs> franchise, <always, laughs> the franchise always control the process all of the way through, and then perhaps allow you to speak to some of the franchisees right at the end of the process. But what is happening more and more in terms of disruption is that people are still going to Google, they're still going to the advertising website, still going to the the shows, but now they're going off into the internet and starting to look at the buzz around the brand. What are people saying about their experience? What are they saying in terms of their operations? What are they saying in terms of being um, uh, a parent that ch pays for their child to go to a sports franchise or, or, or a, a, um, a B2B client that, that's paying for consulting services? You know, what are they saying about, about what they're receiving? Now, that so so no longer do, do people need needing to consider that are thinking of buying a franchise need to wait until the end of a, a selection process before they can speak to franchisees and, and clients and verify what they're being told. In fact, there can be total disruption now because if I find a I can get I can go from an advertising place, I can go to the franchisor's website, I can find out who the directors are, I can see if they've got any recommendations on LinkedIn, I can join the discussion groups they join and, 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 see, and see what they've got to talk about. You know, I can find local franchisees and follow them on Twitter. If they follow me back, I, I can direct message them and ask them, are you enjoying this franchise? Even before I, even before I inquire to the franchisor. That's I mean, that, that, yeah, that is... That is such a different disruptive factor. You're absolutely right because you basically take control of doing your own due diligence at a very deep, yes. very granular level, and that's fascinating. Can, can I ask? To. Terms, yeah, if you choose, to, absolutely. Has, there has to be that <laughs> conscious decision, indeed. Can I ask if you decide to do your own due diligence? What would be the best channel to start with? Would you go to Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, G+, all of them? I think that you have to satisfy your own curiosity and you should, I think some things to be aware of is is not necessarily whether there's good and bad comment about the franchise concept you're interested in, but more the, the, the main thing to be aware of is no comment. <laughs> 
because <laughs> you because <laughs> no comment means no interest, um, or or kind of a fear mentality where where gagging orders are put on on a community, and you really don't want to be get get involved with that kind of rigid structure. So, don't be afraid of negative comment. Um, look for the balance between the two. We're we're all used to using websites like TripAdvisor, and we know that that there's some balanced comment. There's some um, strange comment, but we, we're quite sophisticated. We learn, we, we're getting very good at filtering uh, and get, getting an understanding. So, so the more content that you can find, you'll start to find the central message of, of what the brand really stands for and what you'll be entering into should you invest in, the, in that franchise business. Huh. Have you seen, have you had any experience or have you seen any traditional um, franchises begin to suffer? because of this new level of transparency? I think it's starting and it's all about adoption curve of, of, of user understanding. Now what I mean by that is obviously uh, the 30 years old and younger will be very used to using the internet in all its facets and gathering a wide array of, of information in order to make decisions, trusting the the comments and recommendations of people that they've they've never met and using that information in a quite a sophisticated way. Most people that come into franchising, both running them and investing the, in them, tend to be between 40 mid 50s. And although they're we're all internet users now, sometimes um, we're we're not so diligent. Also, there's a generational thing. Um, I would say that people who are come from the baby boomer kind of era, um, as they're called, are more used to the do what you're told, and it's rude to say, uh, to to question me. Whereas I think in the, in the generations um, sort of post post 60s, post post 70s, people were taught rights and responsibility, and it's okay to to question authority. It's good to ask, but then you've got a responsibility to make a decision. So there's there's an impact of of a generation and and how they understand media and how they use media. So so the franchise community is a bit protected from full disruption at the moment, but the disruption is coming. And then, <laughs> <laughs> it's inevitable, right? And it's not going to stop. <laughs> okay, can I ask something else now? Because essentially, you know, you described the ideal process of doing of doing due diligence, and in in so doing, inadvertently perhaps, you also described what a franchisor should do in order to establish uh, confidence in their brand. And, and perhaps even game the system. I mean, if I had a franchise and I heard you describe that, I'd be thinking, okay, I've got to be in LinkedIn, I've got to have the right comments in, 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 the, in the chat groups, I've got to have my directors talking to people and saying the right things. So if we reverse engineer that, how difficult is it, or how easy is it, for a franchisor to basically control all those channels to the degree that they project, and not necessarily f uh, false image, but not, uh, not the right one either, and they create a kind of controlled through social media that was uh, evident in the past through other channels? I think that the way to get a true reflection of, of the values of the franchise and the people in the franchise, I think that one thing that every um, uh, franchisor and anyone that's in business that's building a brand or working within a brand is to realize is that people mostly care about people. They don't, you know, that whenever you go into a due diligence process, you the brand may be the thing that you recognize to start with, but you always go face to face with someone, and it's when you get face to face that, that the real impact happens. Now, what an opportunity there is for people that are leading franchises to help their people really say who they are and why they're passionate about what they're doing. I think the franchisor can get involved in some outsourcing and some departmentalism and I think that it's important to help franchisees have a common brand message. So for example, if franchisees are all using Facebook, um, it might be useful for the franchisor to be sharing uh, infographics and information that, that, that's relevant. Uh, to the to the brand and, and and to their sector, so the franchisee doesn't have the burden of creating that kind of content. But I think that franchisees should also have the liberty 
to be themselves and and to, to talk to their clients and would-be clients because this isn't just about broadcasting as you said earlier on this is about talking to people this you know how, how did I get to know yourself um, I, I bought your book uh, which is excellent by the way uh, and uh, and I said David Amland I bought your book and I'm gonna ask you questions all the way through and you are fantastic because you answered my every question and through that uh, there was a, a I think a collaborative collaboration built and then there was a friendship and now and now it's culminated in working together on on events like this so yeah. how could that have happened historically it couldn't have happened yes you're right um, yeah, you're absolutely right I'd forgotten about all the bits right because it seems so natural but you're right there was a process <laughs> there yes a process now the, now I think in franchising um, the, 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 the processes uh, need to need to soften and what I mean by that is generally speaking when a franchisor is looking to help someone invest in their brand and help find out if they're right for their brand they will go through a very rigid process they'll go to an exhibition or they'll advertise on a website someone will apply they'll send them a brochure they'll ask for a form to be filled in and they'll go through a very rigid structure so and often the first request is let me phone you let me speak to you but when someone's phoning you you realize at that point whoa this is serious I, I'm being brought into a, into a, a serious process now and probably about 90 percent of everyone that inquires doesn't proceed with 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 their point of interest because they're being often being asked for too much too soon but I think if franchisors helped help people to dialogue with them through in softer ways perhaps through through tweets through through sharing comments through um, through LinkedIn or Google Plus or on any social channel that that is available through through texting whatever it is it's a way of bringing people into the conversation without going into that hard due diligence process and I think that we can we can help people um, to really build that relationship before we're asking them for too much commitment that's awesome and I love the fact that you brought up the fact the, the point that it's humanizing and it's people talking to people because mm -hmm. this is a recurrent theme across many of the issues which we um, encounter in business today whether it's selling or communicating or creating a brand image or um, establishing a new business and I think it's critical it's something which is relatively new in the way that we're considering it but it's never been new really it's been at the heart of businesses since the beginning it just it became convenient for us to forget it a little bit or to drop off in importance as we scaled up it through the throughout the 20th, 20th century because of industrialization and massive scale and now we're going back to that and I think that's fascinating because it touches on everybody okay we we can look at perhaps uh, Alex is there any movement on the poll at this stage with all the things we've, we've covered um, you know, there's there's been a little bit of movement as far as uh, the brand values of a franchise. I think that's gone up a couple percent. But what I'm kind of curious about, because I'm still seeing about 50% of people that participated in the poll are still saying, I wouldn't buy a franchise. So I'm curious, as someone that is uh, interested in communication and talks about it a lot, I'm curious, Nick, do you think that a lot of people are still saying they wouldn't buy a franchise because they don't feel like they're seeing this transition? They don't feel like they're seeing this engagement from franchises as of right now? Um, I'm not, I don't have ever any evidence to say uh, one way or the other, Alex. Um, I think that um, part of the challenge of being silent is that if your channels of communication are not open then all you can do is guess uh, what I'm hearing of, um, from franchisors that are very open in their communications on multiple levels is that they are getting far more people involved at earlier stages and they're building relationship at earlier stages uh, and they're also helping people to see their futures in different ways now what, what I mean by that is one of the main aspects that is a barrier to entry is is trust now if you don't trust um, the brand if you don't trust the people if you don't know them and yet you're being asked for maybe a hundred thousand pounds or hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of investment in five years of your life 
you don't know the people, you don't you don't have enough trust to, to really to, to go into into that decision. So how can you build trust? How can you get an understanding of your future? How can franchisors give people that crystal ball understanding? And there's a number of strategic ways that that can be done. Every system will be different, but for example, I'm just pulling one thought out of the air. Um, every franchisor will have a number of field managers and they will be responsible for supporting franchisees in, in, in their day-to-day -day trading um, in a number of ways. You know, how about the field managers um, supporting and um, having communication in the field through Twitter with franchisees because then anyone considering Thing, um, investing in that franchise could follow that field manager and they could get a real sense of how they would be supported, the kind of challenges that come along and the way that the brand and that manager works with, with their franchisees in order to support them to overcome their problems and, and encourage them in, in their growth. Huh. It's fascinating. Nick, can I ask at this point, you know, we're talking about a lot of money and we're talking about a five-year period. Suppose somebody buys into a franchise for five years. What happens at the end of the five-year period? Do you renew, disappear, go off into the sunset, <laughs> retire? <laughs> well, any of those is a possibility. <laughs> I think, I think right. that uh, um, many franchisors, many quality franchisors will speak to you about what's called an exit strategy before you even invest into the franchise. So it's the franchisor's job to help you realize your dreams and aspirations through trading under their brand. And you have a better chance in most respects of achieving your dreams and aspirations through working through franchising than going into business as an entrepreneur for the first time. Uh, now, um, just for example, the British Franchise Association NatWest survey, uh, which is a national survey in the UK that, that looks at franchising, 93% of franchisees traded successfully right the way through the recession. And, and the amount of financial output grew, whereas the rest of the, the, the economy was shrinking. So I think that there are tremendous advantages uh, of getting involved in franchising. So it's, you know, you've got to find out what's important for you. You know, you can't get involved passionately in business if you're not happy to replicate what somebody else has put together. And, you know, you know, some big franchises that you might think of that we know on the high street, like a, a Domino's or McDonald's, you know, you never go in there and the franchisee is trying a, a curry night just, just to see how it will work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it just would never happen. You know, it's, uh, it's, you follow the brand and you do it enthusiastically and if you can't then it, you should do something else. It's Yeah, it's fascinating because the moment you mentioned that what I really thought of is that franchises in many ways seem to be more consistent in their brand values than single vertical brands which seem to have a lot more play in their regional or even international uh, presence points. So, <laughs> so you're, you're quite right because I've been to, to McDonald's from Shanghai to to San Francisco, and they're all identical. <laughs> they are, but interestingly enough, each country has adaptations. So there's something called master franchising, and and that's a concept where a franchise may be successful in the U.S., but they wish to grow operations, say, in the U.K. or Shanghai or wherever it may be. Um, but if just to you, we've spoken about McDonald's. McDonald's, in if you go in, in France, you can buy a beer there, but you can't yes. in the U.K. So you, then there has to be an adaptation to the demands of the local market within the uh, proven constraints of the system. Yes, absolutely. Yes, you're right. Because I, I get a lot of, you know, whenever I'm traveling in the Med, you know, whether it's Athens or, or Madrid, you get local cuisine, which appears in the menu in, in a standardized format. So it's quite fascinating, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the parents won't I, go in. <laughs> I have, I okay, so I have a couple of, I did like a shout out for like questions because we're getting down to the last 10 minutes. So this one's a quick one from Simon Ryan. Um, Nick, are you joining the UK Franchise Hour on Twitter tonight? <laughs> I, uh, that looks like a military eight time. It's 8 o'clock. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that, that's UK time. Yeah, I know Simon very well. And well done for getting that question in, Simon. Yes, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very pleased to join you. Uh, Simon's someone that, that I work with and, and I'm helping introduce to the UK franchise community and uh, he's very enthusiastic about uh, his mission around social in franchising. So, so good job, good job si Simon, and yeah, I'll be joining you later. Okay, so speaking of communities, we have this great question from Mary Stovall, and she says, um, apparently it's not coming up right now, uh, do you have any recommendations for franchise communities in the U.S. on Google+, Twitter, or LinkedIn? Uh, she represents a co-working space in the U.S., which is a franchising model. So do you have any recommendations for franchise communities in the U.S.? Um, I think it always goes back to um, people, not the channel. Uh, one one thing that I t tend to see, you know, I was I was at a franchisor uh, forum a couple of days ago, and the question was, which is the best uh, social media channel to use to recruit franchisees, or to this or to that, and the answer I gave was none of them. Uh, it's 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 about the people, you know. You've got to understand your people, so. What, what is the demographic of your people? What are they passionate about? What do they want to speak about? And, and, by, and how do they communicate? You know, it's, there's no point. I had a franchisor say to me some time ago, Nick, you'll be proud of me. We're going into the world of Twitter. And I said, do your clients use Twitter? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, maybe you better find out because you're just going to be speaking to yourself and they're, unless they're using Twitter. This is about engagement. And I think that's the key. The channels are a red herring. They, the channels are not the focus. People are the focus and communication, communication about what you're passionate about with people that care, that care about you and, what, and you and what and you about them and what you're providing for them. This, this is what businesses are fantastic about. This is bit what businesses do. Um, the bit that I think perhaps um, an analogy that might be helpful is... Um, Rather than think of business in terms of structures, let's think about how we used to think of disruption in businesses around the water cooler. You know, mm -hmm. we had all these structures, but but all of these ad hoc conversations used to happen that broke the structures in house around the, the the water cooler. Social media is the biggest water cooler known to man. So uh, so now we're all we're all gathering around the water cooler and we're having our own discussions about. But these are published discussions, and and you can really know what's on on your on your clients' minds if you engage with them. Engage with them. Don't just push your sales messages. <laughs> <laughs> what an uncompromising message! Because engagement requires time, Nick. Right? It requires time and effort, and more than that, it requires an awareness, a real awareness, of your audience's needs. Yes. And speaking from direct experience, I know that there are very mature businesses that actually haven't got that. So for a new franchisee to come into the social media stage and do that is incredibly difficult, I suppose, in terms of time and effort and commitment and perhaps skill. So how would you square that circle? How would you help them along? Well, normally people respond to the new things when the old thing doesn't work anymore. And, and never beforehand. So I think that uh, you generally have to wait until the disruption is so severe that people are reluctantly prepared to listen to something new. Um, I think that's that's a lot of people are resistant to change. And again, remember, a franchisor is responsible for the brand, the control, the integrity, and so it's difficult. Also, there's the challenge about finding budgets, how to how to manage communication, um, retraining, uh, changing uh, franchise agreements, changing uh, employment agreements. There's, there's, there's a significant amount of ripple effect that needs to happen. And I think every business needs to understand that from directorships level to start with, there needs to be a significant consultation period where 
the business is looked at strategically in the light of social and how that's impacting on them, that there needs to be future, there needs to be engagement now, protection for the future, working more closely with clients into the future, understanding that hierarchy is dismantled and we're all back to the street market, we're all looking at each other and trading eyeball to eyeball again. So what does that mean and, and how are we going to make that part of who we are? <laughs> so simple, right? And so difficult at the same time. And I, exactly. I totally agree. <laughs> uh, well, I have one final question. <laughs> I have a final question, which is more out of curiosity, really. Um, you mentioned, you know, finding the money for a franchise. You know, essentially the range is quite broad. You know, starting from as little as a few, you know, uh, hundred, you know, hundred thousand dollars to going up to a million. How does one? You know, how, how would you raise finance? Is that necessarily all part of the person? Does a franchise, for some franchise, or help in that? Um, are there specific franchise finance channels somebody can go to? Um, normally, franchise, for normally financiers are very supportive of people that are considering investing in a franchise. It's subject to the franchise itself, and it's subject to your own financial history. Uh, but because of the high success rate in franchising as opposed to self-starting, uh, generally speaking, uh, funding organizations are very supportive when it comes to, uh, to business format franchising. So you have to understand your system, you have to have researched the local market, you have to understand what the expectations are in terms of what you're going to do and what you might achieve from the franchisor's level, but you must show that you've adjusted and adapted any business models to take into consideration local demographics, local competition. So it's very, very important you really understand understand your business, but generally you'll find that financiers are, are sympathetic to funding people that want to build their business in franchising. That's brilliant, and I suppose you're right, because in retrospect, the business model is already tried and tested, so it's not an unknown quantity, so the you're variables saying. are lessened, absolutely, it makes perfect sense. Okay, mm -hmm. Alex, do we have any more questions as we're nearing the end of the show? We, time is rapidly running out. Uh, anything I, from the audience? Um, I do I do have one more question from Charles Perkins again, and this one, to me, it just seems kind of fun. Uh, he says, some may not want to invest so much for so long, so do future franchises need to be easier, faster, cheaper to try out? So do you think that franchises will get to the point where you can, like, try them on for, I don't know, for like a month, and then you're like, ah, oh, this isn't for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting question, uh, Nick. Um, I would say it's unlikely, and there are a number of reasons why. Um, it's uh, the only people that succeed in franchising are those that are successful, highly enthusiastic, prepared to follow the system, and utterly terrified at the point of entry. Uh, you know, you you have that terror is a necessary uh, component into driving you to success. It's so focused the mind, that, right? Pardon? It focuses the mind. Absolutely. You have to you have to get up and go you have to go to sleep thinking about it and waking up thinking about it and put every ounce of your resource. And if you don't and you're not prepared to take that kind of risk, you, you probably uh, should stay with the day job. That's amazing. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Alex, anything else? Are we wrapping up? Uh, we are wrapping up. I just brought the poll back up again. Um, it looks like numbers haven't changed currently, but we'll see if they change as you know our our later audience comes in and watches this. So just so everybody out there knows, I will still be looking at this poll. So if for some reason it takes you a while to process this and then you're like, oh, I do want to change my mind, the uh, link is still in the event. Uh, copy and in the comments. So always feel free to change your mind about franchising. Awesome. Okay, great. <laughs> and with that, Nick, thank you very much for coming here today. We're wrapping up a little bit. Franchises, we saw that their businesses like any, any other kind of business. We saw they're being disrupted by social media to a degree that perhaps wouldn't have been imagined even a few years back. We see that they're morphing even as we speak. And the challenge ultimately comes down to that ever-present element every time we talk about social media and people. 
and it comes down to people, it comes down to humanity, it comes down to unearthing and connecting with that element that makes everything work onwards based on trust, understanding, clarity and transparency. And with that we reach the end of today's Hangout on Air. I will see you all next time. This is David Amelon signing out. Thank you.